You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here talking with James Steidel from StopTheSprayBC.com. He's an advocate for ending the glyphosate spray on BC's forests, and I'm really excited to be able to talk to him. James, thank you for taking time to talk to me. Oh, yeah, likewise, Derek. Thanks for inviting me onto the show here and uh, chatting about this important issue. I think uh, maybe the best way for us to dig into this conversation to start off is just to get some of your background. So if you could tell us just a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in this subject. Yeah, I, I grew up on a on a ranch in the, the North Caribou and uh, they started, um, well, we had a lot of the pine beetle, right? So they logged a lot of these uh, forests uh, that actually weren't all pine. There's a lot of spruce. There's a lot of aspen and Douglas fir in a lot of the forests around us, and uh, and they mostly replanted pine and spruce. And I actually did a lot of that tree planting when I was younger in the late '90s. And uh, yeah, we we replant them, and I always thought that uh, we were doing a good thing. The whole tree planting, silviculture side of things, and you know, we were replacing the stuff we logged. And I didn't really know that. Um, well, I kind of knew about it, but I never really saw it. I never thought too much about what happened after we tree planted uh in the 10 years afterwards well the aspen because there was aspen there when they logged it a few of them right but the way that forests work is there's going to be a lot more aspen after a disturbance that's just how they grow and you got to have a lot of aspen to have a couple aspen 100 years down the road in that forest so um a lot of these aspen grew up uh, along with the pine and spruce that i planted um a lot of the spruce actually died uh, because they don't like to be growing in the open sun, especially after they got sprayed. Um, yeah, and then they went in and sprayed all these places. And then they started spraying like right up to our property line. So in 2010, they they uh, sprayed right, up, right to the backside of our property line, like a huge cup lock. And we kind of asked them not to, and we didn't want them to spray right next to us. We had honeybees, and they did it anyway. And then that's kind of when this whole thing started. I was just like, this is crazy. You know, especially the next year and I saw everything dead. But I'm like, why are we trying to grow pure pine trees? Like this is insane. We just had the pine beetle infestation and we're planting basic, we're replacing, like we're making it worse. We're creating conditions for another pine beetle attack that's going to be worse than it was last time around. Uh, so just intuitively made sense to me that we should get more diversity on the landscape. So I, I thought I'd write an article about it because I was trying to be like a freelance journalist, I guess. And that led me down a whole bunch of roads, including uh, um, learning about Suzanne Samard and her research. And she's a big deal now because she wrote a, a book called Finding the Mother Tree that, uh, you know, selling really well. And it's kind of changing the whole conversation around forests and, and our concept of forests, which is basically being uh, the forests are a place of, you know, Darwinian competition between these tree species that's a zero-sum game which means you know if one wins the other one loses but where we're finding that's not actually the case that uh you know when they when you let both species grow like the aspen and pine together you get uh actually more biomass overall and you also get a forest that's more fire resilient so you know it is it's it, there's obvious benefits to having the aspen like what good is all your pine plantations if they all burn or if they all die of a disease. So yeah, I learned all this stuff, talk, uh, trying to write this article and, and uh, you know, talking to Suzanne Samard back in 2010 was just a, a game changer because she pointed me on all these directions of research that I followed up on. And I wrote the article, I never got it published. I just kind of pitched it around and nobody was interested in it. Kind of the same problem I still have today. It's a very difficult topic to get covered in in the newspapers and well, our local paper does a really good job of it. There has been some coverage, but it's it's hard to get people to understand the significance of this war on deciduous in BC and Canadian forestry. So that's kind of the back. That's how I got into this issue. Uh, the article was never published. So then I was like, well, I did all this work. I'm just going to be an activist. Screw it. You know, and uh, kiss the, uh, the journalism aspirations goodbye and just uh, dedicate this side of my life to educating people about the value of deciduous and because it's really really important and people don't know it and there there needs to be a cultural shift in how we look at uh, our forests and how we look at our leafy tree species because right now in canada we look at them as garbage and nothing but weeds uh, get rid of them that's got to change and and maybe it is a problem with 
perception or uh, lack of perception, really. I mean, w by listening to the story, it sounds like you got interested because you actually saw the f effects happening firsthand all around you. And so that's why you got interested in the subject and started uh, researching and everything like that. Most of us, you know, we go about our daily lives, a forest fire pops up beside us, we get scared, but then they go put it out and we go back to our daily lives, not thinking about it or worrying about all the different factors that could play a part. And uh, so maybe we should fast forward a little bit. How did you meet Herb Martin? Uh, so, um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a, uh, an interesting story because we actually met back in 2010, uh, but we didn't really know each other. We went on a field trip in Prince George to uh, this place called Rosebud with these really old growth uh, Douglas fir. And we kind of chatted a little bit about sort of brushing and silviculture because he was a, he was a brusher. And then, uh, yeah, we kind of like lost contact. And then I started doing a stop the spray thing and I, he independently started doing his own stop the spray stuff. Uh, and he was, um, one morning he was on the CBC radio and my friend calls me up and he's like, you got to hear this guy on the radio. He's, uh, he's stealing your thunder. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> the exact same stuff you're saying. So I, you know, I looked up the interview. I'm like, holy cow, this guy is, you know, he's on the exact same, uh, wavelength. And, uh, I couldn't find him anywhere, but, uh, I, I tracked him down and, and then we went and, grabbed a grabbed a burger and a beer and and we're like well let's just join forces and stuff uh but he's he has a real uh, strong background in uh silviculture he's run brushing crews and he's uh, been a logging supervisor and knows a lot of the history of of the forestry uh the, the back to your other point there is how you know a lot of us don't really see this stuff and we just kind of you know worry about it when a fire happens and we go back to normal um you know, I, I didn't really think about it either. And I grew up in the bush. Right. Like I always like appreciated the aspen trees and deciduous, but uh, even for someone like me, I didn't really understand the significance of silviculture and the brushing side of things specifically until it literally was right in front of my face until it was something I could actually literally see the before and after effects. Cause otherwise it was just a place, you know, a cup block on the side of the road you're not really paying attention to over the years um so yeah even someone who should and i tree planted on and off for 23 years now you know i've like heavily involved in the forest industry and silviculture and, and even i didn't really uh appreciate the significance um but we were everybody really needs to start looking at this because it is widespread man it's it's happening everywhere they're not spraying around you guys but they're brushing they're manual brushing which is something that we also need to talk about uh, maybe we'll get to that in a second, but maybe we should, we should begin with the spray. The thing about the glyphosate spray is I don't understand how it even began in the first place. This began in the 80s, right? Yeah, they started doing research in the 70s, and then they approved it for use in Canadian forestry in 1984. And then uh, they started using it uh, quite a bit. Like, I'll just mention this briefly. Before 1987, the provincial government was responsible for reforestation in BC. And... Uh, you know, like uh, the common assumption is government's pretty useless at doing stuff. And just like uh, most other things, I guess, they were pretty bad at reforestation where they let a lot of these plantations kind of grow naturally, which in my, in my mind was actually good. So I'm glad that they kind of didn't do a good job. Uh, but in 87, they, uh, you know, along with this global trend of like Thatcherism and Reaganomics, they kind of wanted to privatize a lot of stuff. So they privatized the forest management and they gave the responsibility for reforestation to the corporations and that happened in 1987 and that, after that the things got really really bad like they just basically started spraying and brushing everything and and just kind of implementing this totalitarian uh monocrop vision upon the landscape and that really kicked in in 87 and you can see the statistics show how much worse the plantations have gotten since then like way less diversity now than before 1987. But, it, but anyway, yes, sorry to cut you off. That's just, that's this the real quick Coles Notes history of, of what happened. Well, well in, in researching the history and how it all began, you must have heard lots of arguments in favor of the glyphosate spray. So I thought, in, in to play devil's advocate here for a second, what would you say is the best argument in favor of the spray that you have ever heard? And quickly blow it out of the water for us. Oh, well, it's, it's, a, it's an accounting argument. 
And that's basically what modern forestry is. It's accounting. It's not based on ecosystem science. It's based on uh, how to sustain your harvest levels uh, by growing trees as quickly as you possibly can. That's right? insane. So, it's, it's, uh, but the forest, so now they're looking at it as a, a cash crop, like a product. Absolutely. That's a whole history that's the history of forestry that it's got started in the 1700s in germany uh where you know the the prussian king there wanted to know how much they could log uh without um compromising you know his uh the here's ability to harvest and generate revenue so they did scientific studies of how fast the trees were growing and and that would tell them how much they could harvest today and so it's basically the whole history is is accounting for lack of a better term and that's the primary argument for spraying today is that it juices up the yield projections so that you can harvest more today. It's all about getting as much timber as you possibly can today. And this all feeds into these computer models that they have down in Victoria. And if you didn't spray, um, you know, the yield of today would have to go down based on the model projections. And you would have to tell the companies to harvest less today so that's that's the best argument for for why they spray it's just an entirely theoretical uh accounting game that's being played and spraying is critical to that game right it's not it's not based on reality it's not based on uh risk assessments it's not based on the fact that we're losing a lot of these plantations to fire today and it's not based on the possibility that these trees we're spraying might have an economic value uh, in the future right so yeah it's the, the entire argument is just to make the, the conifer trees grow as quickly as you possibly can make them grow uh forget about ecological succession forget about uh, this deciduous trees in the forest uh forget about all the species that depend on that stage of the forest's life uh, forget about fire resistance forget about carbon sequestration all that stuff doesn't matter there's one goal that we are implementing upon the landscape and that is maximized revenue for these big multinational corporations so that they can cut as much as they possibly can today. It's just greed, right? It's a, it's a greedy um, philosophy that is being implemented and it, it makes economic sense, I guess, if you're only worried about money in life. But uh, I don't even think it makes economic sense, not if you factor in all the, all the problems we're having with these, with these plantations. Absolutely. And uh, not to mention all of the research that we're ignoring, right? Like mountains of research showing that this really isn't helping. <laughs> well, they've, they've got some studies that they're convinced, uh, you know, they're doing some very specific studies where they've removed deciduous and the pine trees grow quicker. Uh, and I'll admit it, I've, I go and look at these, these blocks that they sprayed, the pine trees are growing really, really well. You know, so if you look at little microscopic instances of where you've done this practice and the trees are growing quicker then uh they're right but if you look at the landscape level and what happens when every single plantation is a single tree species plantation after plantation after plantation there's no old growth left there's no deciduous left it's all just a gigantic landscape of even age pine trees like are they you you really start to wonder um if there's anything upstairs there if there's any kind of uh comprehension going on in the uh, the higher ups if there's any kind of like what kind of qualifications they have to be getting paid public dollars for what they're doing like it seems to me they're completely incompetent and idiotic and yet these are our chief foresters and our deputy chief foresters and our district managers they're all making this decision these decisions and they're all making sure that this vision has been implemented on the landscape. And we pay these guys like six figure salaries. They think they, they think they know what they're doing, but they, they have no evidence uh, to really uh, believe that it's um, going to work on a, on a large scale that they think it's going to work. Right. And it's, it's really just about corporate interest at the end of the day. It seems like it's just ignoring science. And meanwhile, we like we have contaminated blueberries, starving moose, uh, herbicide signs put up in the forest, but you know, animals don't know how to read. Yeah, so <laughs> man, it just 
it, the, the more you look into it, and I've been doing this for, for 10 years now, 11 years. And it's just absolutely uh, sickens me that our society has gone along with this for so long and is still going along with it, especially considering the new things that we're learning. Like we're learning that this stuff doesn't go away, that glyphosate will persist in the vegetation for uh, 12 years. They found uh, contamination. Right. And they put on the sign 72 hours. (laughs) Yeah, the sign says stay out of there for 72 hours, but the next year there's going to be glyphosate in the surviving berries. Uh, you have a one in four chance of the glyphosate being higher than what um, is allowed in grocery stores. And, uh, you know, grocery stores, they've done a big survey of fruit and vegetables and 0% of the samples, they did like 6,000 samples or 4,000 samples, 0% had glyphosate in them at all. They're above 0.1 part per million. Uh 26% of the samples in these sprayed blocks had levels higher than 0.1 part per million, which is the default level allowed for vegetables and fruits. So we're contaminating our backcountry with the stuff. And you guys are lucky down there. They don't really spray all that much, but in Prince George, they spray everything. It's like this year, hundred percent of the interior spraying was in Prince George. Uh, if you look at the map of, of all the historical spraying, like they've, they've blasted our area. It's insane, like in every direction, and they're still doing it. And we still need to get to like uh, the the aspen being where the nesting birds like to go more than the majority of the time. Uh, aspen also sequestering more CO two and pumping out more oxygen. <laughs> Broadleaf species forests are also not seen as a fuel source. Yeah, yeah. I, you want to you want to really, talk about that right now? Yeah, we should get into that. Okay, so. Um, just did a little presentation there at uh, down in Quinell on the weekend. And it's called the amazing world of Aspen. And this is kind of getting into a whole different part of uh, the conversation, not just about life state contamination and, um, you know, the, the whole uh, idea that we've got to just grow conifer monocrops and stuff. This is actually about the value of the thing we're getting rid of and challenging the idea that these trees that were, uh, eliminating not just with glyphosate but with brush saws are like worthless uh, weeds so my presentation is called the amazing world of aspen and i kind of cover all these crazy things about aspen trees that that we as a society haven't really been taught uh you know i grew up in a lumber town and we did a lot of forestry education in school elementary school and uh high school and we never learned anything about aspen trees you know like i think maybe in outdoor education we learned that maybe Maybe some birds lived in them, but I don't really even really remember that being stressed all that much. So everything that I've learned and that I cover in this presentation is stuff that I've, you know, researched on my own. And uh, maybe one day we can do a presentation down in uh, Peachland or something. <laughs> That'd be uh, perfect. Yeah, we can do an outdoor venue or something because it looks like COVID is going to be around with us forever. Um, which is what we did on a weekend. We did, did uh, at the amphitheater there at uh, 10 Mile Lake. It was a lot of fun, actually. Uh, so yeah, these, these aspen trees and, you know, it, the same kind of stuff uh, goes for birch as well. Um, and cottonwood is they're really fast growing trees. That's why we get rid of them is because they're considered a weed because they have this phenomenal growth rate. And this growth rate is actually unparalleled by any tree species anywhere at our latitude around the globe. So they're the quickest growing woody tissue that we have, which means they sequester the most carbon. Uh, every single study that's looked at it has confirmed that aspen sequester more carbon than any other tree species in less time. Uh, they just uh, came out with a study in April in the uh, up in Alaska after a forest fire. They found that uh, where the aspen and birch was growing, they, it sequestered 400% more carbon than the spruce. Uh, so that's just phenomenal, right? We're not yeah, talking about super yeah. points. We're talking about exponentially more carbon being sequestered in these, in these deciduous forests. Um, and it's not just the, uh, carbon sequestration. If you, uh, you know, as everybody knows, when you're, you know, walking barefoot on the pavement, you want to walk on the white strips because it's going to be a lot uh, cooler on your feet than the, the fresh blacktop because the darker color absorbs more heat. Uh, it's the same way with our forests. And if you look at a hillside, you'll, the aspen and birch will stick out because they're way lighter in color. Right. This means they don't absorb absorb as much heat and it, that's also very significant um uh conifers absorb almost twice as much heat 
their albedo value is almost twice as uh, low. The, the albedo is the amount the tree reflects. The aspen's uh, albedo value is almost twice as much as, uh, as conifer. So if you have a landscape of deciduous, it's gonna absorb way less heat than a landscape of conifer. And of course, we're getting rid of the trees that absorb the least amount of heat to grow the trees that absorb the most heat. Um, you know, for, for starters. Uh, so you've got the uh, carbon sequestration, you've got the higher albedo value, and to top it all off, well, there's, there's other factors beyond these three, but the third one is fire resistance. And that's the, the aspen is, uh, and the birch, they're incredibly fire resistant. And this has to do with a few things. Um, you know, they don't have uh, resin or pitch that's flammable, and they, they have way more water in their, in their tissue. Now, one of the common assumptions is that aspen kind of like they take over the wet sites in the forest and, uh, you know, they hog all the good productive sites. That's why we got to get rid of them and give the conifers a chance to grow because these things will actually hog all the good spots. But actually, that's totally nonsense. I mean, sure, they do like to grow in some bottom, bottom areas, but they also grow on hillsides. And the area around the aspen is going to be damper, more moist and have more nutritious soil not because of that's what the site was before the aspen was there, but because the aspen created that. Uh, the aspen uh, allow way more snow through the canopy. Okay, so if you ever walk through an aspen forest in the winter, you're up to your knees in the snow, and as soon as you get into a conifer stand, uh, there's no snow. The snow all got trapped in the needles and sublimated or, or blew away. Uh, and the same thing happens in the summer, way more rain, uh, penetrates the canopy of an aspen forest to the, reach the forest floor than in a conifer forest. Uh, in one study in Colorado, there's actually negative rainfall interception, which means more rain was reported underneath the aspen than what, what fell out of the sky. Wow. So it, act, it actually created its own rain. And they don't really know how or why, but probably condensation on the leaves and the drip down from there. Uh, yeah, so... You know, when you walk through a forest, all of a sudden you get into an aspen stand, it's way cooler, it's way damper, it's way more moist. And that's because those trees, the architecture of the forest just basically sucked in more water. They're like straws in the, in the forest. They, they allow the water to get to the forest floor. And then there's, their soil is also richer in humus and it's more biologically active. And this all absorbs more moisture and hangs on to moisture better. So that's why that's why the aspen don't burn as much is because they are basically gather more water the rest of the year and they hang on to that water better. It, it seems to like this comes back to the idea that for some reason, there are some people who think that they're smarter than mother nature and mother nature needs to be guided by us. But you know, I was just watching the documentary fantastic fungi. Have you ever heard of Paul Stamets? And uh, he was talking about, no, I'll uh, the mycelia of the, the mushrooms, how they connect trees, even of different species, and they'll send the nutrients and th the mushrooms will even decide to make a clearing in a spot of the forest. It seems like we're just trying to create a monocrop instead of letting the forest do what it does naturally. In its own biodiversity is always going to be better. When it comes to doing a cut block, maybe we should get into brushing first, because uh, I don't know that much about brushing. Yeah. Oh, just just to touch on your point there about the about the fungal networks. Uh, aspen actually is associated with more species of fungi than than uh, other conifers. Uh, they haven't really measured with pine, but uh, subalpine fir and um, and black spruce, trembling aspen has way more mycorrhizae associations. Uh, they've done a study on where they've discovered that aspen actually associates with uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae, and these are two two of a few few important classes of mycorrhizae uh, that most plants can only associate with one or the other and aspen can associate with both. So basically aspen has a more, uh, a much more diverse and capable army of fungi helping it out wow. to gather nutrients. from it. And the aspen roots also go quite a bit deeper than most conifer root systems. And that's also how they can partner with different uh, mycorrhizae. So you know, having aspen in your forest, that those uh, those mycorrhizae can literally unlock minerals out of out of rock, and that yeah. will end up in the tissue of the aspen tree. Then the aspen tree falls down and rots, 
and now all of a sudden you have a bunch of minerals on the, the surface of the forest for the spruce the spruce to tap into. It's a whole system, right, that, that's developed over millions and millions of years. And we think we can make it better, like you say, by just getting rid of <laughs> the aspen and growth forest like a carrot field. Like, you know, trees aren't carrots. They're way more complex. There's way more stuff going on. That, and here we are growing pine plantations everywhere. Like, man, we're, we're in for a huge rude awakening, not just with these fires, but, uh, you know, with disease as well is going to is going to start to be a problem. Um, I'm seeing a lot of pine trees around uh, Prince George with red needles that I haven't seen in the last few years. So they might have gotten a little bit of a, a rust infection. It might not be fatal, but, you know, it might be signs of, uh, of things to come or a needle blight or whatever, whatever it might be. Uh, so, yeah, we, we look at the forest as a farm and, you know, glyphosate is one tool that farmers use that we've applied to forests. And the other tool is brushing, where you physically cut down the aspen and birch. Usually with brush saws, but you also go in and girdle them, where you uh, kind of slice off the bark around the base of the tree if it's a bigger tree. And that will kill the tree. And yeah, we're doing that uh, all over British Columbia, anywhere the deciduous is growing. And there's actually a really... Uh, sadly uh, hilarious news broadcast out of Kamloops uh, by the journalist Adam Donnelly there from about two weeks ago. Yeah, we did a post on Stop the Spray BC, but it was uh, it was like a, a feel-good positive news story about um, a government-funded program basically t- teaching kind of hard-to-employ uh, kids out of the criminal justice system uh, how to fight wildfires, right? And then the journalist goes to this uh, location where they're getting trained And they're not learning how to fight wildfires. They're learning how to run a brush saw and they're cutting down fire-resistant deciduous in this plantation. Yeah, I kid you not, man. And it's all, it's like, no, the the journalist does not mention whatsoever what they're doing. This has nothing to do with fighting wildfires. It's all just, uh, oh, look at this awesome uh, work program getting these kids working. And they're in there. uh, It's right near the Tremont fire, right? And they're, they're talking about the being impacted by the fires and one of the kids is like you know i read about it every day in the news when i wake up i smell the fire you know and i just want to be out here protecting my community and then the the next shot it cuts to the cuts to a shot of them like hacking down all these aspen and birch trees so yeah we're brushing this isn't just a prince george northern bc thing we're doing the same thing all through british columbia okay we're doing it in your area we're doing it in the hills above penticton uh Mm -hmm. we're doing it around uh the Monty Creek fire or the White Rock Lake fire there. Tons of areas were brushed on the northern flank of that fire. There's tons of brush plantations. Some of those plantations were brushed uh, five times. So they, they cut it, cut all the aspen and burst down once and it would grow back. They'd go back, cut it down again and again and again and again. Like it's relentless. Like they were so fixated on growing these pine plantations that we will literally shoot ourselves in our own feet right. and screw up communities and then expose communities to risk of fire. And yeah. we'll still do it. Even with smoke in the sky, even when you're breathing the smoke from these fires, we're still doing it. Like that is complete insanity. Like how stupid are we? You know, I watch this stuff. I'm like, I, I shouldn't be so harsh because you know what? If uh, probably 12 years ago, I probably wouldn't have taken a second thought about that. Um, so we're all, we're all, uh, we're all responsible for this. And I was too, at one point, you know, I, I totally bought into the idea of brushing and growing pine tree plantations. And it's just the importance of, of education and learning, right? It's like, I don't see it that way anymore because I know better. And so the question is, how do we get people to, uh, learn this stuff? And it's really important for, you know, you to be doing this, these kind of shows and hats off to you, Derek, for, Thank you for, you know, being interested in this talk and having me on to talk about it. And, and I hope that this will spark conversations in other areas and we can start like a, a snowball effect here to get change happening. Absolutely. That's, one, that's one of the reasons I do my little presentation is also to get people talking about this. And it's just amazing how many people grew up in the bush in British Columbia and they don't even, and they don't know it. Right. And not just like whites like me, but also even indigenous, uh, communities you know like we've we've forgotten so much and we're not and we're not being 
we're not being encouraged to learn it because our society, our society is so controlled by these big corporations that yes. are fixated on conifer plantation that they don't, uh, they're not like the council of forest industries. That's a huge corporate lobby group that invests a significant amount of money into childhood education. Okay. They have programs for elementary schools, high schools, uh, they're not teaching kids that deciduous is fire resistant. I'll tell you that much. Right. That's something they're not kids, right? What are they teaching them? They're teaching them about forestry. They're teaching them about forest management and basically uh, hoodwinking the, the public from a young age into thinking that everything is being well looked after out of the landscape. Right. And it's totally like, like what's, what is happening is an unmitigated crime against our children, against our communities, against wildlife. Uh, and and it's and it's still going full steam ahead. I would like to uh, maybe get towards uh, talking about the future of like what sustainable forestry would actually look like. But before we get to that, I would like to just kind of ask you a little bit about because we've been hearing in the news about uh, on the island how they've been cutting down old growth trees inside of the forest there, and there's been a a lot of controversy around it. Some people like going and you know uh, barricading making barricades other people getting mad at the barricades because they're worried about their jobs i was wondering if you want to weigh in on that oh i've got opinions about all this stuff Derek. <laughs> all week we can chat for hours and hours and hours and one of the important things that's been forgotten in this old growth protest and what is never mentioned very rarely mentioned is that we used to have a hundred thousand direct forestry jobs in this province and 20 years ago okay we're down to fifty thousand jobs now and kind of depending on the data source, uh, the harvesting, the amount that we've harvested every year has either stayed the same as 20 years ago or it's actually gone up. Okay, so our workforce has been cut in half and the harvesting has either gone up or stayed the same. And nobody talks about that. Okay, so, you know, these, these, uh, these tree huggers are a threat to jobs. Give me a break. Okay, they, they do not pose a threat to jobs. And if they do, they're far less of a threat to jobs than rapacious capitalism that has automated mills and thrown tens of thousands of people out of work uh, right. to pad the bottom of these megacorps, right? Like in Prince George is like so many good examples here. We've lost, uh, we've lost over a thousand direct mill jobs in Prince George. Okay, there's still tons of just as much as getting cut now as it ever was. Where did all these jobs go? Uh, so I grew up working in a place called Clear Lake, which was a small mill, which is its claim to fame was uh, to be the most inefficient mill in British Columbia. <laughs> uh, every board was touched by it. Yeah, but we, it made money. It made money up until the day Canfor closed it down. And there was a trailer park there where people lived or that raised families there, and they all got kicked out. Everybody got evicted. They basically just snuffed the town out off the map. You know, it had like... A couple hundred people lived there and it just everybody had to leave and all the production got shifted to polar which is a super mill in bear lake and the production there is 10 times as much as what clear lake could ever do so clear lake did about 10 logging truck loads a shift okay and they they employed 364 people this new mill does 100 logging truck loads a shift and it employs uh, we don't know the exact numbers, but we're going to say to be generous, 150 people. Okay, so it's it's half the it's half the employees. Not being generous, it's probably less than that. It's half the employees and ten times the production. So there you go. So anybody that's worried about jobs is full of crap. Okay, they're if they're worried about jobs, they would have shut down uh, these big super mills. They would have opposed. Uh, the BC Liberals getting rid of the local jobs, local logs for local mills requirement. You know, that was required. If you had to cut, you had to process your trees at the local mill up until 2003. And then the, the BC Liberals, Kevin Falcon was probably behind it. He's running for the BC Liberal leadership. He uh, and whoever else, Rich Coleman, with, you know, these other people that don't care about communities, uh, they got rid of that requirement so that all the logs could be shipped to super mills. And then that paved the way for closing all these small mills. Uh, so the biggest, the biggest threat to jobs is, 
is all these huge corporations um, cutting costs, cutting jobs to maximize shareholder value, right? Like a couple of valleys, like a small amount of old growth is going to threaten jobs to the extent that these corporations have. Give me a break. Uh, that's not even close to being true. Uh, so that's what I'm going to say about the, uh, the uh, Ferry Creek protesters. And then the narrative is completely off base. You know, and anybody that uh, is opposing these guys because of the jobs is a complete hip- hypocrite. Because I guarantee you, they said nothing when all these small mills were closed by these big corporations. Absolutely. And it makes a lot of sense of not, don't point the finger at the guy at the top point the finger at each other and keep fighting with each other because divide and conquer is the name of the game. The logging industry will not collapse if we do selective logging. There's just going to be less money for Jimmy Patterson. Okay, Canfor earned <laughs> $4 billion. Oh, seriously, they Canfor earned $4 billion so far this year. Right? And they're still going to, but now that they're not making as much money as they did over the summer, they're going to shut mills down like over the next month because $4 billion uh, you know, because they're not making as much of a profit as they as they have so far. Like it's completely sick what Jimmy Patterson is able to get away with, and the media in the Lower Mainland just worships this guy. Like, look at what Keith Baldry says about him, and and uh, well, even the CBC uh, recently, Gloria MacRanko interviewed Jimmy Patterson. It was just the biggest uh, puff know, piece. What the word <laughs> is, but yeah, they're just the puff piece right there's no tough questions for jimmy there never is he's he's considered a a great british columbia right okay but he's like destroyed jobs and he's small um and he creates a culture within these corporations that he runs that actually makes them awful places to work nobody likes working account for they're terrible places uh you know he uh ever since his days as a used car salesman he used fear, right? Like if you were, whoever sold the least amount of cars, they get fired uh, every month. It's the same thing that he does with, uh, with his corporations. Like people are always worried, worried about their jobs. Um, you know, and he screws over everybody as much as he can. So if you're a, a logging truck driver, you've got to wait like 90 days to get paid. And if you want to get paid quicker, you have to knock 10% off your invoice. Like that's just standard Patterson procedure. Right, and then he runs like a monopoly on the the, the medium sized grocery stores in Prince George. Save on like it's just it's just pretty crazy how this guy can get away with basically monopolizing and corrupting the free market of all these regional economies and making us worse off. But yet the big media in British Columbia doesn't say a word about it, and they let him get away with it. But anyway, back to the selective logging thing. <laughs> um, you no, know, we could we could do selective logging, but but Jimmy Patterson isn't going to let that happen, right? So, That's more expensive. That's less money. At the bottom line, he's not going to do selective logging, and they don't. Canfor is the worst. Canfor does the worst. Has the worst logging practices. Uh, they do all the spraying. Uh, they've got the worst mills to work at. Like it's an awful, awful company. What, what in your mind, if we were to finally do this all right, if we got rid of the glyphosate spray, we stopped doing the brushing, what would uh, sustainable forestry look like? Well, you'd have to also get rid of these big corporations, get rid of West Brazier, get rid of Canfor. And to be honest, they already have one foot out the door. Like they, their model isn't going to, their model depends on the rapacious pillaging of massive landscapes of primary forest. And when those, when all, when all the primary forest is gone, they're not going to have a profitable business model anymore. They're, they're going to, like all that billions of dollars that they earn this year, they're not investing that in BC. They're buying mills in other parts of the world, right? They've bought all these mills in, in the US South. They've bought uh, mills in Sweden. I think they have more capacity outside of Canada now than inside Canada. Uh, so they, they already see the writing on the wall, right? This is, it's not a sustainable model they have here. And they're just going to log it as quickly as they possibly can and make the most money as they possibly can. And then they're going to hit the road and kick us all to the curb, just like they did to the small mills and other communities around the interior. Uh, so it's just a matter of time before they're gone. I think we need to kick them out now. They've broken their end of the bargain. Like there should be antitrust legislation brought to bear against these monopsonies. Uh, because they are distorting the free market in our community, and they've been doing that for decades. 
So to me, a sustainable forest industry is one where you've got a bunch of different actors, a bunch of different companies, and a bunch of different products, right? Right now, it's all just geared to two by fours, and that's it. So we're very, it's a very volatile market. Uh, we could be doing stuff with deciduous, like birch and aspen can be made into paneling and, and furniture products. You know, if you have a diverse forest, you're going to have a diverse forest economy. And what we're doing is we have a, we don't have a diverse industry and we are converting the forest into something that is not diverse either. We might need to wrap this up soon. So I'd like to just ask you, uh, is there anything else that you think that you'd like to say for people to do? Uh, Obviously, we want people to go to stopthespraybc.com. What else would you urge people to do? Uh, well, we need to get on the, the phone with the district forester. And I was just going to say, I'm a chief forester in Victoria. And I think just before I got cut off, I think it's just important to remember, it's not just about timber values that we need. We need our forests to serve other things as well, like uh, ecosystem services uh, in general, but also, you know, cattle ranching depends on deciduous forests more than conifer forests. Uh, foraging for berries, that's more of a deciduous ecosystem type thing. Uh, the guide outfitters that are doing like, you know, people might not agree with hunting, but it's an important generator of tourist dollars in northern BC. They depend on that, those diverse forests that isn't timber values, right? It's, it's wildlife values. Uh, trappers, hunters, foragers, mushroom pickers, all that stuff uh, is not about timber values. It's about having a diverse forest um, that's not just, every, it's, that's not just um, a pine plantation. So I think that's the kind of message we need to send to the Ministry of Forests is that is that we need to protect these other values in the landscape. And we're focusing way too much on what these big corporations want and need and not enough on what the other parts of our society want and need. Um, so send letters to the Chief Forester, that's Diane Nichols. Uh, Shane Berg is the Deputy Chief Forester, the Deputy Minister, I forget his name, but the Katrine Conroy's of the world and before her was Doug Donaldson. These politicians never have any power. They're, uh, they're controlled by the bureaucracy. It's a situation where the bureaucrats are, are professional foresters and they have created the impression that they are the experts and that they need to be listened to uh, in the sense that they're apolitical, like an apolitical doctor or something. You know, you don't argue with the doctor and you don't argue with the forester, but that's not the case. Foresters are entirely political. Okay, they're making political decisions. When they decide to get rid of Aspen and Birch, that's a political decision they're making. And the politicians need to take uh, take that back from the bureaucracy. And we need the politicians to be making political decisions, not unelected bureaucrats. And unfortunately, that's what we have right now. Uh, I think that was really well put, and I think that's a great way to wrap up this conversation for now. Uh, James, I want to thank you again so much for taking time to talk to me. Everyone, this is James Steedle from www.stopthespraybc.com. Once again, I'd like to strongly urge anyone listening to this to go to stopthespraybc.com to learn more about this subject. James, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me. And what I usually say to my guests is that hopefully we'll talk again in the future. To you, I'll say hopefully we won't have to talk again in the future. Yeah, me too, Derek. Uh, although that was uh, that was a lot of fun, you know. Yeah. And uh, keep in touch. Maybe we do a little Aspen presentation down there one day. That would be great. I would love that. So keep in touch. Okay, thanks again. Thank you.